Greetings comrades, my name is Jake Anzels and welcome to another Church Council in a nutshell video. Today we'll be looking at the Council of Chalcedon. Now this council convened in 451 AD. The Pope at the time was Pope St. Leo I or Pope St. Leo the Great. He was Pope between 440 and 461. He was overseen by Emperor Marcion, he was Emperor of the Roman Empire between 450 to 457, and he was presided over by Saint Anatolius, Patriarch of Constantinople. He was Patriarch between 451 to 458, and there were 520 bishops present, which made the largest of the seven first ecumenical councils. The background for this council was that in 446 AD, two years after Patriarch Saint Cyril of Alexandria died, there was an Archmandrite or superior abbot in Constantinople called Eutyches who, fearing a return of Nestorianism, began teaching a branch of monophysitism leaning towards the docetistic side known as Eutychianism, which I'll explain in a minute. There was also trouble among several bishops and sees, and there was needings to, attest to address the teachings of the Second Council of Ephesus. And just to clarify from the last episode, Nestorianism basically denies the hypostatic union between Christ's human and divine natures, meaning that they were separate and not mixing within him. And in a very big way this was visible was the reject was Nestorius' rejection of the title of Theotokos, which means God bearer for the Blessed Virgin Mary, and instead Chris and instead replaced with Christotokos, which would mean Christ bearer. And this was because Nestorius believed that the Blessed Virgin Mary was only the mother of Christ's human nature and not his divine nature as well. Because you watched my my video, the first council of Nicaea and the first council of Constantinople, you know that there's going to be more councils after that one. However, the reason why I only ever said there was the Council of Ephesus is because this second council would be declared non-ecumenical. It took place in 449 AD due to clashes between the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Alexandria. Patriarch Domnus II of Antioch saw Eutyches' era first, and in 448, Patriarch St. Flavian of Constantinople condemned Eutyches and his heresy and excommunicated him. However, Eutyches protested and together with the support of Patriarch Dioscorus of Alexandria convinced Emperor Theodosius II to convene the Robber Council of Ephesus in 449. They ignored the let a letter that Pope St. Leo I had sent which was which would later be known as Pope Leo's Tome and reinstated Eutyches and then deposed St. Flavian and would replace him with Dioscorus's supporter St. Anatolius and deposed many other bishops who disagreed with Dioscorus and Eutyches there. Although St. Anatolius would soon defect, hence why he's a saint. And this council, as I said, would soon be declared non-ecumenical because of the rejection of what the Pope said and his delegates, which is why it's sometimes referred to as the Robber Council of Ephesus or the Latrocinium of Ephesus, to stop the confusion of making it seem like it's ecumenical. When Emperor Theodosius II died, he was replaced with Emperor Marcion, who immediately sided with Pope St. Leo and decided to convene a new council, which would be the Council of Chalcedon. Now, Pope St. Leo wanted the council to be convened in Italy, however, with the Huns attacking along the, Dan the Danube River, they decided to have the council in Chalcedon, where, Mar where Emperor Marcion could deal with the threat quickly if they tried to invade. Now, concerning the actual discussion and the events that happened during the council, the first thing that really happened was the trial of Dioscorus, because Patriarch Dioscorus had not only tried to depose Patriarch St. Flavian of Constantinople, but he'd also excommunicated the Pope. Whether or not he has the power to do that is another thing entirely. However, it wasn't going well for Dioscorus, and so he stopped turning up after the second session, which he was punished by being deposed from his position. The bishops that he had removed from office were reinstated, and Dioscorus's decrees were declared void. And to clarify, Patriarch Dioscorus was not being punished mostly for supporting Eutyches, but for his violations of canon law. Dioscorus himself had said, If Eutyches holds opinions contrary to the doctrines of the church, he deserves not only punishment, but hellfire. And so it was his, his rebellion against the church that was causing this, not simply here because he was supporting Eutyches. And this would eventually lead to a very intense moment with Empress St. Pulcheria. Now she was the sister of the Emperor Theodosius II, and she married the General Marcion to make him the Emperor, and Marcion would respect her vow of virginity in their marriage. And the two of them, Patriarch Dioscorus and Empress St. Pulcheria, would meet. Empress St. Pulcheria said to him, in my father's time, there was a man who was stubborn, and you are aware of what was made of him. And she was referring to the patriarch, St. John Chrysostom of Constantinople, as he was exiled from his archdiocese because some of his supporters were heretics. And Patriarch Dioscorus said, 
and you may recall that your mother was prayed at his tomb as she was bleeding of sickness. And that's because the Empress Eudoxia clashed with St. John several times which led to his exile. However, she would later on die of an infection after a miscarriage or stillbirth and she was left bleeding. Now this would be a very big mistake because this is the same woman who, after Nestorius had tried to lead a smear campaign against her, starting with how apparently she had seven lovers, she would crush him legally and have him exiled to the monastery in Antioch during the Council of Ephesus. And so Empress Pulcheria here slapped Dioscorus. She slapped him so hard that he lost several of his teeth and she ordered his confinement, which resulted in the guards pulling out some of his hair in the process. Marcion would have him exiled to Gangra in Turkey. However, before you protest about this treatment of him, know that, um, that Patriarch Dioscorus ordered his supporters to attack St. Flavian as he held onto an altar in a church, and he would die three days after from his injuries. Dioscorus' supporters in Egypt rejected his replacement, Patriarch Proterius, and when Dioscorus died in 554 AD, he chose Antipatriarch Timothy as his, as his successor. Now, Marcion wanted the council to speed up, otherwise they would have to postpone it and relocate it back in Italy some at some point in the future. And so he said, if you need to make a new creed, just get it over and done with. However, the Council of Ephesus had condemned the creation of any new creeds. And so after looking at Pope St. Leo's tome, which was the letter initially sent to St. Flavian back in 449, but ignored by Dioscorus, they read through it and decided that it, that it was sufficient. Three chapters in it were initially opposed for being potentially Nestorian in nature. However, after comparing it to Patriarch St. Cyril's 12 chapters, they found that this wasn't the case and that the tome was indeed orthodox in teaching. And with that, the trial of Dioscorus was over and Pope St. Leo's tome was accepted. Now concerning Eutyches and his heresy, Eutychianism is a form of monophysitism and that, the, and that revolves around the word physis, which is Greek for nature. Monophysitism teaches that Christ had only one nature, and diophysitism teaches that he, Christ had two natures. Now on the spectrum of monophysitism, on one side you have docetism, and on the other you have Arianism. Arianism teaches that Christ was human, he only had a human nature. Docetism teaches that Christ was divine, he only had a divine nature. Whereas diophysitism says that he was both human and divine to varying degrees. Eutyches' heresy, Eutychianism, was slightly towards the docetistic side of monophysitism whether or not he realized it at the time. You see, he taught that Christ's divine nature was infinitely, infinitely larger than his human nature, like a drop of honey or vinegar in the ocean. So his insignificant human divine nature would have been absorbed completely by his divine nature. This would mean that he was of two natures, human and divine at, his, at the moment of his conception, but not in two natures after the moment of his, of his conception. Now, fortunately, Eutyches' heresy was based around a mistranslation or misunderstanding by Patriarch St. Cyril of Alexandria. You see, he believed that the Greek word physis meant the Latin word persona or person. However, Greek theologians would have interpreted that word to mean nature. And this would mean that when, Saint, when Patriarch St. Cyril had taught there is only one physis, since it is the incarnation of God the Word, he believed that he was saying that there was one person, but was accidentally saying one nature. And this would be lead to Eutyches' heresy, unfortunately. We know that there are two natures in Christ, the human and the divine, but only one person. And the consequences of this would mean that Christ would only be consubstantial with the Father and not consubstantial with man. He wouldn't have been fully man and fully God. And thus, Patriarch St. Flavian of Constantinople's excommunication of him was reconfirmed, as well as Eutychianism being declared a heresy. In order to correct this, the Chalcedonian definition was written. Again, it wasn't a new creed. It wasn't. It was simply a theological statement. Because it would have definitely been a lot harder to try and say this every week in church than it was the Neo the Nicene of Constantinopolitan Creed. I can tell you that right now. And to paraphrase this, the Chalcedonian definition says, Following then the Holy Fathers, we all unanimously teach that our Lord Jesus Christ to us is one and the same Son. The self same perfect in Godhead, the self same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Co-essential with the Father, according to the Godhead, the self-same co-essential with us, according to the manhood, like us in all things, sin apart, born of Mary, the virgin Theotokos, as to the manhood, acknowledged in two natures unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the difference of the natures being in no way removed because of the union, but rather the properties of each nature being preserved, and both concurring into one person and one hypostasis, not as though he was parted or divided into two persons, but one and the self-same Son, and only begotten God, Word, Lord, Jesus Christ. That, that's paraphrased, of course. The actual thing is much longer. So the result of this council 
the Chalcedonian definition had been written. In it, the coessential with the father would oppose Arianism, coessential with us would counter Apollinarism, the two natures unconfusedly, unchangeably would counter Eutychianism, and indivisibly, inseparably would counter Nestorianism. It would also reconfirm the, the Nicene and Constantinopolitan creeds along with the First Council of Ephesus. The Latrocinium of Ephesus and all the teachings from it were condemned alongside with Eutyches, and the bishops deposed by Dioscorus were reinstated. The Tome of Leo and two of St. Cyril's letters against Nestorius were approved. There were 28 canons written, but the 28th one would be later on made void and only the first 27 accepted. And two other canons would be added on at another date. Number 28 was extremely controversial, as expected, when it comes to anything coming out of Constantinople as of late. You see, Canon 28 basically said that the Bishop of Constantinople could enjoy the same privileges as the Bishop of Old Rome, and on the account of the removal of the Empire, or the fall of Rome, the Patriarchs of the Church could then be ordained by the Bishop here. So if anything happened to Rome, Constantinople would step in. Which, again, was effectively another power grab. And once more, the Patriarchs of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch weren't too fond of this, because Constantinople was barely 120 years old. Thirteen Egyptian bishops refused to agree with the tome, and they believed that this was because it was heretical in its teaching. However, this resulted because of Marcion wanting the council to finish. And so when the bishops gathered and wrote the Chalcedonian definition, they agreed that the wording seemed to disagree with both St. Cyril of Alexandria's letters and St. Leo's tome, but they said that this was mostly a matter of wording and not theology. So the words seemed a bit off, but the, the point about his teaching wasn't. And despite the council recondemning Nestorianism, Dioscorus' supporters didn't like the reinstating of the bishops that they that Dioscorus had removed from office. This would lead to them breaking away and forming their own church in Alexandria. This is the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, led by Dioscorus' successor from Timothy onwards, known as the Coptic Pope, and a few other Oriental churches would break away. And the Coptic Pope currently resides in St. Mark's Cathedral in Cairo. There have been attempts to bring them back into communion, and it's shown that there really hasn't been much difference in theology, it's just mostly wording and terms. The problem is that not all the Roman emperors treated the Coptics with much respect, and they suffered a lot of persecution under Islam, so it's a bit understandable why they'd be a bit hesitant. The Coptic Catholic Church is in communion with the Catholic Church, and they believe in Chalcedonianism, as opposed to my the Myophysitism of the Coptic Orthodox Church. For instance, if I were to describe this, I'd say that Chalcedonianism would be Christ's two natures superimposed in his one body, whereas the Coptic Orthodox Church believe that in Myophysitism, the two natures are mixed into one body. So it's very, very close in their teachings. However, the Coptics themselves actually don't like Eutyches for what he said. They believed that he had misled Patriarch Dioscorus, which is why they don't agree with Eutychianism or Monophysitism, whereas other Oriental Christians do. Unfortunately, this was the first of several churches being lost, because the rest would break away in the Great Schism later on. That's effectively the Council of Chalcedon in a nutshell. So if you like this video, please do give it a like. Please do share my videos. Please do comment what you think of them. Neither in and any other video you want me to do. Please do subscribe to my channel so you can see more content. And please do ring the bell so you can keep updated with my video releases. The next episode will be the Second Council of Constantinople, in which we deal with Nestorianism again. Fun, you know. Nestorianism is like the new Ar Arianism. You know, Arianism was doubtful several councils, and now Nestorianism is as well. That'll be for then. So anyway, God bless you all. See you next video. Comments. Until then.